There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I was in the mood to do a tag. I don't think it's necessarily going to be tipsy since I've only had one sip out of my first glass, but let's see how tipsy I get by the end of the video. It's going to be a quick and dirty one, so probably not. This is the Nimrod book tag, an original tag just launched earlier today at the time of filming by Matthew of Mayberry Book Club. Matthew's channel, Mayberry Book Club, is a new one to me. I've been aware of it, just haven't had time or focus or concentration to get to know it until very, very recently, and I'm really enjoying what I see. Matthew is a very serious reader, highbrow literary fiction, a lot of stuff in translation, just uh, all good things happening over there. So if you haven't checked out Mayberry Book Club, go do it now. So uh, I didn't know that Nimrod started out as having a positive meaning, and then mistakenly took on a pejorative meaning. Matthew talks about it on his channel. This is prime, in other words, territory. I was fascinated. The original meaning, it was the name of one of Noah's grandsons or something, who was known as a mighty hunter and powerful king. I checked into Matthew's interesting story about how it came to have a pejorative meaning as a jerk or a stupid person coming from an episode of Bugs Bunny. I think etymologists don't particularly support that one, but it's a great story. Anyway, so the tag is about books that make you feel stupid and so on. So let's get right to it. The first prompt is books that made you feel stupid. And I just was hard pressed to come up with any. No, but the one that automatically came to mind was one of those series of the very short introduction series of books. They're all about 100 pages. You can buy them in most bookstores and they are mostly terribly written and useless. The one on African history was really good and one other one that I read. I read about six and four of them were just embarrassingly bad. But the one that I didn't get much past page 10 was Game Theory, a very short introduction by Ken Binmore. I think I understood 5% of what I was reading in the first five pages and it was all downhill from there and I don't think I got past page 12. I'm a game player, people, but I'm not a game theorist. I couldn't make head nor tail of it. I guess the other one that would come to mind would be Faulkner's, what was it? Absalom, Absalom. I was riveted. I was so deeply engrossed in it, but I couldn't really understand what was going on. And I think Adam of Memento Mori was one of the people who said, Sean, you need to start slowly with Faulkner and work your way up to Absalom, Absalom. So I will go back to that, but yeah, I couldn't. And then don't get me started on literary theory, post-structuralist, psychoanalytic, literary, critical stuff. We're not going there today, people. I feel it's stupid. It doesn't make me feel stupid. Prompt number two. Books you wanted to love but couldn't. I just... Oh, just watch my channel, people. <laughs> I mention one in every video. I rant about one, at least one a month. But the one I'll choose because I haven't talked about it recently at length would be Lincoln and the Barlow by George Saunders. I thought it started out poignantly and beautifully and the experimentalism of it I took to deeply at first. And then all those freaking ghosts. I was supposed to care about all these ghosts. No, I hated it by the end. Should have stopped after that scene of President Lincoln embracing the corpse of his dead son. Stop! It could have been just a short story. Ghosts. Number three, the books you wanted to hate but couldn't. I struggled with this one, so the one I've come up with is the novel from, was it the 1980s? Bright Lights, Big City by Jay McInerney. I read this about two years ago, I think. I can't remember why I read it, but I didn't ever really want to read it. It didn't sound like a Sean book, and I wasn't really impressed by the opening chapters, and then it just sucked me in, and I thought it was a stunning work of literature. It's not necessarily that I wanted to hate it, but I certainly expected to hate it, and it didn't start out in a way that hooked me, but by the end, I thought, this is a really fantastic work of literary fiction. Number four, books you no longer enjoy. So that, for me, is easy I rarely reread, and I don't think I've had an experience where I've reread a book and hated it, one that I had previously loved. 
I would like to become more of a try again reader in that I bail left, right and center. I'm a big bailer. It's the best thing about my reading life. But I would like to experiment and I keep saying this and I never do it with picking up books that I bailed on some time ago and giving them another try. But in terms of where I'm at as a reader, it's literary fiction only people with some nonfiction. And we're not going to talk about this trendy opinion that there's no such thing as literary fiction. That's another tag, which I, I'm not touching with a 10 foot pole. Uh, am I tipsy yet? I read some genre fiction when I was younger, especially mysteries. And I remember enjoying them probably as a teenager. I don't remember ever reading them after I graduated high school. Other than I did an Agatha Christie novel as a buddy read with my cousin about four years ago. It wasn't one of the famous ones, and I didn't really like it. And then I've tried once or twice since then, and I just, I hate mysteries. The problem for me is I don't care who did it. It's not interesting storyline. Why? No. And I just don't like formulaic stories. End of story. All genre fiction is formulaic. Moving on, I don't enjoy that. Five, books that won you over on rereading. So one of the themes of the second half of my answers to this tag is a graduate course I took as a master's student at York University in Toronto decades ago. And it was on James Wharton and Cather. And it traumatized me, even though it was one of the best classes I took in that year of master's. Everything else was just made me want to kill myself just graduate school in English. Maybe it's better now, but it was all... You had to stick your nose so far up the various literary critical post-structuralist theorists' asses to force out a paragraph, a shitty paragraph of literary theory. Oh, anyway, um, even though that class, that professor, she was quite nice and she wasn't all literary theoretically fixated, I still had such a terrible experience as a grad student that those writers are tainted for me. Edith Wharton is the least tainted of the three, and I reread Ethan Fromm about a year ago and loved it. I did it for novellas in November. I know I read it during that graduate course, but I have no memory of it, so I didn't have a bad experience other than that it didn't make an impression on me, but I thought it was an amazing novella when I read it a year or so ago. More on that class later on. Number six, books you love by a writer you dislike as a person. There aren't many, because to be honest, if I don't like the writer as a person, I would have no interest in reading the books. I don't think that applies to people who are dead. I don't think so. But I also don't care much about the lives of most writers that are dead. I might like their fiction, unless I'm really fascinated by them, which is rare. Like Barbara Pym, I've read two biographies of her, and she was a lovely person. But writers that are contemporary with me and where their personalities is a part of... Steve Donahue has riffed on this uh, several times on his channel about how when certain writers die, their work just falls out of fashion because their personality was large and they had such a cultural presence that as soon as that aspect of the phenomenon... I think John Updike is one of the ones that he often uses people just stop reading their work because it's not that good or you know it was sustained by their personality when they were alive and if i don't like the person especially if there's like some me too stuff or anything like that i don't read them everybody has their own way of dealing with that and that's how i deal with it for living contemporary writers i don't separate whatever i know about the writer from my reading of the work and so it's kind of like no i'm not gonna watch bill cosby <laughs> ever again but there's one that I think he's not a very nice person, but he's not evil. He's just really arrogant, and that's John Irving. And I don't care. I don't really like watching interviews with him because he just comes off as a really pompous ass. But that hasn't stopped me from enjoying a, a, a few of his novels, especially as Kim of K. Becker's Books and I were talking about just the other day, A Prayer for Owen Meany. But yeah, I think he's a pompous ass, and I don't care. He also hasn't written very many good novels recently, but anyway. Seven, books you dislike by a writer you like as a person. So that I would go to the can-lit shelf and talk about Timothy Findlay, who died maybe 15 years ago. And he was an openly gay novelist in Canada and very much on the cultural scene. He was larger than life on the radio, on TV all the time, and had a great personality and was a bit kind of an avuncular 
Uh, he was more anti than uncle-y, but what, what's the adjective for ant? He was the gay uncle, gay avuncular cultural icon in Canada. Canada doesn't have icons, but anyway. But his fiction isn't very good, and nobody reads it. It's pretty much, I think it's mostly out of print since he died. And finally, pr prompt number eight. Books you still want to love one day. So I would mention William Faulkner again, because of what I said before, but also Willa Cather. I have been able to enjoy Edith Wharton since that traumatic year as a graduate student back in the 90s, but I haven't been able to get over my th issues with Willa Cather, and my memories of reading her stuff were just deeply tainted by how unhappy I was as a grad student. So I hope that I can experience her anew one day. I think it's decades away. And Henry James, I think I'm just right that he's not worth anybody's time. All right, so that was fun. Thank you, Matthew. And I'm going to tag a bunch of people. I'm also going to open it up to anybody who sees this tag and sees Matthew's, the original version. You should just do it. I'm going to tag some people. Kim of K. Becker's Books. Freddie of Sluggish Reader. Grace Eichmeyer, Amy Poole, Cousin of Always Doing, and Greg of Supposedly Fun. That's it. Thanks for watching.